So this is Dr. Bodhi Timms. Uh, I'm the program director for the master's in herbal product design and the post baccalaureate certificate in cannabis science. And we're gonna talk about co-evolution of medicinal plants and humans. So what we're gonna look at are three sort of big concepts and how they're linked. Uh, and that is the, the evolution of what we'll call natural products. These are the phytochemicals that plants make that they've evolved over time as well. Uh, chemical ecology, which is the influence of the um, ecosystem and in numerous elements of the ecosystem on medicinal plants and those metabolites. And then the coevolution with humans. And this process of selection, influencing gene expression and uh, benefit and also um, uh, non-benefit gain from this interaction. And we'll discuss some of those. So if we start from that evolution of natural products, that image on the top right, the pink section really is what we call the primary metabolism, right? The, these are sugars, pyruvate acid. These are things that the plant needs for structural reasons. Uh, they may need it for uh, signaling compounds, um, sort of addresses for proteins to end up at. And then the green is what we call the secondary metabolism. These are the phytochemicals associated with medicinal use. And they are linked through um, extended pathways. And each of those small pathways that have the names given to them, they have numerous enzymes associated with them. They are uh, proteins that are folded in such a way that they catalyze reactions. They catalyze the subtraction of some component of the original molecule, the addition of some component, or a sort of change of orientation. Remember, we're talking about three-dimensional um, molecules here, not just something that's linear. And so the evolution is that these compounds arose from um, basic mutations, and these might have been early in bacterial, um, single cell based uh, development. Um, and then as organisms got more complex, we saw more mutations in some of the enzymes that were involved in the synthesis of these primary compounds that were used for structure and function of that cell or multicellular organism. And um, it could have been also gene to gene transfer, particularly in those single cells um, early in, in uh, evolution where they might have actually passed on segments of their DNA into a, another cellular organism that all of a sudden bended from it. They, they had an ecosystem influence uh, that called for the type of change that that gene coded for. It allowed them to proliferate to greater numbers, survive, and um, pass on that genetic material. And most of these secondary metabolites can fall under the larger heading of a messaging system. Right. These are tools that uh, in, in plants attract, they defend, or they're involved in signals to germinate or to, de uh, to develop. These might be for cell division, or it might be uh, for something like mycorrhizal fungi, which are fungi that um, have a relationship with plant roots, um, exchanging um, access to particular mineral groups that are beyond the reach of the plant's root system, um, and what it gets in return are sugars from the plant. Well, in order for that relationship to occur, there has to be some kind of attractant, a signal to actually attach and penetrate into the plant. So there are a lot of very complex signaling and biological processes in response to that signaling that occur. And these are both signaling external to that, that uh, world of biological entities outside the plant, but also in the plant terms of development, or even you know, we need compounds that are made in the root, we need to get them sent up to the leaf material because there's been an attack on the leaves, et cetera. And so released by one component, um, it conveys instruction and information to another part of the system. Now, the fact that they compounds bind to human receptors is really in some ways just an accident of nature. Right. Um, or it could be that there is some inheritance based on early mammalian evolution, some of the early mammals that were interacting with plants and passed on some of their genome to us 
as we evolved. Um, but really, if we think about it, the two examples I would point out is we have opiate receptors in the vertebrate brains. And therefore, if you have that receptor, that means there's a natural ligand, ligand being a compound that binds to it and elicits or creates a response in the cell. Um, and these in humans, on most mammals and vertebrates are polypeptides. These are endorphins and enkephalins um, that are not at all structurally like opiate alkaloid um, morphine. And yet morphine and heroin and other opiate-like molecules actually bind to this receptor and influence pain transmission. We see the same thing with the endocannabinoid receptors, um, that these existed in you before any kind of exposure to cannabis or cannabinoids, um, and they bind to a number of different plant molecules. They have a, a fundamental function in the organism, um, but now we are beginning to identify a number of different plant compounds that bind to them in different parts of the body. And uh, in that binding, there's an expression of some kind of response, some effect. So these receptors, um, in some instances, are just chance that they work. Um, and the range of these phytochemical reactions, there's a, there's a huge number of cellular targets, if you think about it in the mammalian cell system but there is a limited number of actual mechanisms that we can point to. So there can be binding to intracellular receptors um, after these compounds have passed through this, we call lipophilic cell membrane, lipophilic meaning loving lipids. So our cell membranes are made up of a lot of, of uh, sort of lipid like compounds. Um, on the inside of the cell, it's very watery. On the outside of the cell, it's very watery. So these compounds have to cross that. Once they're there, then they can bind to uh, any number of uh, channels. These are protein lined pores and they influence all kinds of cell effects. Also, they can bind to cell surface receptors. And that's what it's pointing to that image on the left. This is something called a transduction signaling pathway where some signal from the outside binds at the cytosol as the, uh, the intersection of the cell membrane with the uh, external and then defining what the internal is. And there are a series of signals, secondary messengers that come down and they actually go into um, the cell center where you're going to have gene expression and it'll influence that, change it. So these are some of the basic ways that we get cell-based responses to compounds that are outside and influence what happens inside. Again, all we're talking about right now are the fact that these phytochemicals exist and they've existed for a very long time. And in plants, their purpose uh, has been in response to the ecosystem. And we'll see a bit about that when we talk about chemical ecology. But here we're also talking about the fact that these, com these compounds exist in and of themselves as an entity. And they're influenced by uh, change, uh, selection processes, um, giving benefit, um, and so, therefore, we, we have to talk about them as a separate entity in some respects. Now, here's this idea of chemical ecology. And just take a minute and look at that and look at all the different types of interactions that can occur. And these are different interactions and plants need to have the conversational ability to have that kind of exchange in their own ecosystem, which means you need a, a number of different types of compounds. You need some compounds that are always there and ready. And then you, which is a metabolic cost, right? It, it takes um, energy and it takes genetic commitment and expression. And therefore it means something else can't be made um, because there's a limited amount of, of resources to build up compounds. And it takes the energy of all those enzymes to actually do that. So uh, other compounds are made in response to something. That, um, and we'll see what those look like. So just beyond um, the um, secondary metabolites we talked about, you've got plant oligosaccharide fragments. Um, these are you know, simple sugar fragments. Um, they could come from the destruction of cell walls. Um, they're 
their presence in the plant initiates a set of signals. There's salicylic acid. Some of you may know that from acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin, right? Something from um, the, uh, a number of plants contain that. We use that for inflammation and pain. But there is this signal in plants in a, uh, for wounding. Uh, once a plant gets wounded, either mechanically or by an insect or by an herbivore, um, we have we call volatile forms of those, jasmonic acid and methyl jasmonate. And these um, are actually uh, done to signal a whole field of, of plants. Uh, you may hear some yipping in a minute. Um, if you hear a bunch of noise, we have a young puppy that's running around behind us. She's crazy. Um, she's Riley. There you go. And she's deaf, so we can't actually talk to her. Um, we also have cystamine, which are what we call phloem mobile polypeptides. Um, phloem is um, the material that takes the sugars that are made in the leaves and distributes that to other areas of the plant. Um, and so you need to be able to have signals that come down from leaf material that says, hey, we got a, a battle going on up here. Um, we need to have some compounds made. And so polypeptides are just short uh, protein fragments. And, uh, they tend to induce what we call uh, proteinase inhibitors. Uh, proteinase are enzymes that would break down proteins and insects and fungi excrete these. Uh, and they help kind of break down the cell membrane and get into the plant. Uh, and then we've got um, mRNAs, which are um, really a big hot topic in the field of, of plant signaling. These are small molecules that are used in, in gene expression, but they can also be used to signal um, throughout a plant system that something's going on. So here is an example of um, some of those compounds. This is um, phytoalexin is the name of it technically as a defense function. When we say de novo, what we're really saying is in response to or new. So it's, it's made new in response to an infection. In this case, many of you may know resveratrol that we use for any number of medicinal endpoints that comes from grapes. It comes from uh, a, a pine, particular pine that's native to an area of France. Um, but if you think about what's needed, this usually is a response to damage cues in plants when they actually excrete at 60 to 140 um, micrograms per mil inhibits fungal spore germination. So fungi can form spores when there's no food around. The plant root represents food. And if it grows near these spores, there's a signal that gets um, sent out from the plant innocuously, it's not trying to attract those fungi in this case, and the fungi uh, sense it and begin to grow toward the plant. Well, what that means in terms of how much we're taking, that's that 0 0.0002 teaspoons per liter. So not very much, very, very small amounts elicit responses from the environment. So phytoanticipins is another defense function. These are produced and stored. They're always there. Um, and this suggests that they're evolutionary, very ancient. Um, genemic acid from Gymnema sylvestra is one of those compounds. Um, it's interesting if you note, um, the, there's, there are four rings sort of right in the middle. There's a ring on the upper right and a ring on the bottom left, and then four in the middle. Those we call a steroidal structure. It looks like a steroid molecule. Um, and steroids have a number of functions, both in humans, but also in insects. Uh, they can actually impact insects in a way that uh, prevents them from growing and, and uh, can kill them. And we call these um, saponins, glycosides. There's another term called triterpene or steroidal glycosides. And the glycoside is simply a word that refers to that sugar molecule on the bottom left. And what happens is when that sugar molecule gets cut up, um, then it becomes active. So these are stored with that sugar until the plant needs it in a defense function, the sugar is cut off and now you have an active molecule. And this is found throughout any number of different flowering plants. It's not specific to one group. So we also have something called allelopathic function. 
This is considered a phytoanticipant. And black walnut, if you've been black, around black walnut, or even corn does this. A number of plants do this. Jugland is a compound in black walnut. Um, and it actually will prevent seeds from germinating. It'll prevent other plants from growing. Um, so it inhibits their growth. And so that's one way plants can actually protect their area and the nutrients they're trying to tap into. Um, and uh, it gets released into the environment on a regular basis um, and uh, it prevents other plants from growing nearby. And we also get something called kin recognition. Um, what we have in kin recognition is that plants actually recognize other plants of their type. Um, and these are uh, genetically related plants that roots will grow closer to other roots of the related plant. Um, this is based on root secretion. Um, they actually will react to the kin in the aerial portion. So that'll reorient leaf growth when growing near a kin, but not an unrelated plant. So that reorientation of leaf means it'll either block or share sunlight. And that sunlight is really kind of the basis of photosynthesis. Um, but also they tends to produce more seeds interacting with kin than non-kin. So you get these stands of plants, sort of rich stands of plants. And this is another way that the chemical production of those secondary metabolites um, is a way for plants to recognize, oh, this is a plant of my kind and we're gonna share resources. And now you get some, some funky kind of data too on um, plant metabolism and geography. Remember we said that there are a number of different secondary metabolites. You don't have the same secondary metabolites classes of compounds made in every plant. They tend to have specialist compounds that they make. But here they did some studies in Brazil and they looked at geography. So they looked at uh, forest geography, dry grasslands, and then what we call edge ecology, those sections that uh, are broken up or fragmented that have elements of both. And you can see that in that forest um, where there's much greater biomass, you tend to get these compounds called lignans or benzyl isoquilin alkaloids that are part of a particular metabolic pathway. In that open grasslands, you get steroids and pyrazidine alkaloids. Um, and in that gradient area, uh, there's a lot of creative potential. You tend to get really mixed and some very unique um, compounds being made. Uh, these are called ecotones. And um, this is something that we see in plants that come from a forested area and all of a sudden are now, because of uh, um, some disruption in the ecosystem, including humans, and now they're exposed to uh, variability and they begin to make different compounds in response to that. So that's a, a general sense of um, the pressure on compounds made in plants just as compounds. And now we get um, the influence of all kinds of ecosystem elements coming in. And that's a pressure, right? The, the selective function is the comp, uh, just out of mutational uh, change, some compound gets made. If it benefits that organism in that new ecosystem that it's exposed to, right? Uh, uh, a fragmented area, um, then you're gonna see more of that because that will survive at greater rates than other plants. That genetic imprint will survive at greater rates. And when there's uh, seed production, you'll see more of the seed there. And so that benefit gets passed on. And I see a Q&A popping up. Um, okay. Lori is here. Uh, if, um, uh, if you have any kinds of uh, questions about the program, um, just pop them in the chat box and she can answer them. And I'm glad to answer any questions of that ilk um, at the end as well. So we're just going to look at the below ground part. We talked about mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and this is the uh, where the plant roots supply sugars. And here we get the jasmonic acid biosynthesis uh, really leading to a greater enhanced accumulation of soluble sugars in the root. So we're sending stuff down into the root for the fungi. And the fungi actually uh, gets the plant near pools of phosphorus that it could not access on its own. And so it's a symbiotic relationship. Now we have a, a plant Artemisia annua, uh, what we call sweet Annie. 
Um, and uh, the inoculation of that plant with mycorrhizal fungi actually increases our, our artemisin, which is a cisquaterpene lactone. And we use this in malaria. It's a very useful compound. So we, we see that um, the presence of interactions below ground with any number of biological neighbors, right? In this case, mycorrhizal fungi changes production of compounds. Um, flavonoids, which is a type of phenolic, they tend to accumulate at the root tips or caps. And um, they make up a large part, roots uh, exude a series of compounds. Um, and these, these shapes are very easily modified. And what we tend to get is, um, it's a, a response to signals of the presence of mycorrhizal fungi, pathogenic fungi, fungi that might attack. Uh, it might be nitrogen fixation where a plant is able to um, have a, a relationship with a fungus that, or a bacteria in that case, that uh, can take nitrogen out of the air and make nitrogen in a soluble form that the plant root can take in. And again, there's a transfer of carbon to that bacteria. Um, so these uh, exudates in the root tip uh, are a way to kind of send out a message either, hey, what friends are out there? We're looking to party or hey, look, let's have some combat going on. Um, if we look at ginsenicides, which are one of the main compounds in um, ginseng, we can look at the total ginsenicides in roots decline after mid-September. And that tells you something. It says, hey, when everything goes into quiescence and everything's cold and biological processes slow down and everything kind of goes dormant, um, we don't need them. The other thing is they tend to be in greater amounts in root hairs, as opposed to just the lateral roots or the cortex or the interior taproot. You can see this image to give you an idea of the relative location. That tells you in root hairs, that is very deeply involved in the interaction with uh, ecosystem and what's in the soil. Now, um, what we have in ginsenicides are different types of species. We have what we call the uh, panaxidiols versus the panaxidiols. And this is really based on these glycosides. Those little uh, squares with the R3 and the OH, these are glycosides or sugars that hang off. And depending on the presence of a sugar there or the type of sugar hanging off at that point, uh, they represent different types of ginsenicides. That's the designation of RG1, RGE, RB1. Those are all different types of combination of sugars hanging off of a base molecule. And they have different influence in terms of therapeutic endpoints for humans, but also in terms of signaling. And what's interesting, there's always been this conversation that um, we end up having uh, around uh, wild-grown ginseng being better than a, than a field-grown ginseng. And what we're seeing now is that came from um, herbalist lore. And uh, there's a lot of truth in herbal lore. Um, they might not have had the science, but they certainly were able to use the plants and decipher, hey, there's something different going on here. Now in science, we begin to uh, support some of those claims that come from the traditions. Um, and you have greater chemotype variation in wild populations, which makes sense because in a field grown system, you're gonna have a more homogeneous environment where in wild settings, you're gonna have unique niches and, and unique exposure to uh, biological uh, conversations in the soil. And what's important is that some of these variations actually can be used to explain why some ginsengs are really good at um, uh, inhibiting certain brain neuronal activity um, versus others. So again, this is where if we go back and we say, why, why are we studying all this? Uh, what's so interesting about this coevolution thing is what well, we need to begin to understand how to source this material in the appropriate way for whatever we're trying to treat. I'm just checking, um, I'm gonna get rid of that one question from Lori. Um, now we have above ground. And here you have what are called leaf volatile signals. That molecule in the blue box is methyl jasmine. 
And this is response to herbivores and insect, insects as well. Here you have a, a caterpillar and the signaling can occur either just from simple wounding and they, they prove this by mechanically wounding a plant, um, but also there are compounds in the saliva of a insect that can also elicit a response. So here you get a signal transduction pathway. You get compounds being made, synthesis and release of volatile attractants. And in this case, you get the recruitment of these wasps that come in and lay their eggs in the caterpillar. And when those eggs uh, break open, it, it kills the caterpillar. Um, and what they've done, they've got some very interesting studies here. If we look at um, this first section, um, you've got a graph on top and then a graph below with the red boxes. The graph on top is, it's the same moth, the Helioth, uh, Heliothus resins. And that represents the volatiles that the plant gives off during the day. Note that all the boxes uh, represent sort of unique compounds that are not given off during the day. In this case, because this wasp is not active during the day, it's active at night. And so we get these signals that are actually attractant molecules to bring those wasps in at night for particular sets of uh, insect-based signaling. Now, when we compare nighttime volatiles with two different um, uh, uh, moths, right? Not the ones from the Helioth Heliothus varescens, there is no nighttime signal. So it's a highly specific relationship between a particular moth and a particular um, pathogen to that moth. And then if we, we talked about mechanical damage being often the same as, as, as uh, the wounding element from insects. Here we go ahead and we have mechanical damage and there's no signaling at all. So there's something in the uh, saliva of that particular moth that elicits a response at night uh, to attract those wasps. So again, this is a very, what they call a very tightly coupled relationship. Uh, my, well, welcome. Um, you'll get the video afterwards. Thank you for being present. Now let's look at what we call monoterpenes. Anytime you can crush up a leaf and, and it smells really good, right? Those are probably monoterpenes. Uh, a lot of these are in the mint family. Look for a square stem. In this case, um, this is thyme. Um, and what I want to point out is these are our different chemotypes. So you have thymus vulgaris is the genus species. And then linalol, thymol, uh, carboxyl, general, uh, thionyl. Um, these are specific endpoints in the metabolic pathway. And depending on the genetic influence, but also that gene influ influence being sort of carved out by having to interact in unique and different environments. In other words, time is grown all over the place, particularly in the Mediterranean, but they're very different ecosystems. And so you have all these different chemotypes based on where you source your time from. Um, you also have things in the above ground elements of light exposure. And here we take elderberry, Sambucus nigra um, as a medicinal. And this wild elderberry fruits were sampled uh, for two years in the Eastern US they profiled the flavanols and the chlorogenic acid. And what they found that all those metabolites were higher in Southern exposures where there was longer and more intense light exposure, but particularly toward the interior. And they're not particularly sure why that might be the case. It could be that the, in the interior, you don't get the um, uh, um, winds coming off of an ocean setting. Temperatures might've been slightly higher. So there may be some temperature element as well. So simple things like light exposure can um, uh, release these different types of flavanols that protect the plant from light damage, from UV damage. Um, and so um, this last part on the topical, I did my postdoctoral research with uh, green tea. And um, um, what we're looking at is uh, induced responses. So these catechins are what are technically called flavanol threols. Um, they are produced in response to wounding, plant, plant interactions. Um, they are used uh, to sort of cross-link fungal enzymes. So fungi give off enzymes that are there to degrade the cell wall. Enzymes are proteins. 
these catechins are kind of wound through the all of the cell wall of green tea and other plants. And what will happen is as that enzyme from the fungus comes through, these catechins will actually link portions of the proteins in a way to shut them down from being active. And what's interesting, one of the main um, catechins is this EGCG, and that tends to increase with the age of the leaf um, because we, uh, it's got a greater protective function. Caffeine um, is highest in young leaf, and so young leaf tea is going to be higher in, in caffeine, and that's because they represent interactions with the ecosystem and types of interactions that are very different. That little bit about the bottom left gives you an idea of what happens as tea is processed. And uh, going from this uh, white tea, where there's very little processing all the way over to this black tea, um, really what's happening is these, these flavon 3 os these catechins are going from being single compounds to um, what we call um, polymeric, or a polymer means many of the same compounds linked together. And so the fermentation, um, this is similar to what happens um, in the making of wine with some of those compounds in wine, is that we, we have this uh, building of a larger molecule that influences taste and flavor and to some extent defense. Um, last, one last thing on uh, the chemical ecology is parasitic plants. There are plants that actually parasitize other plants. Um, and um, there are a number of them out there. You may have heard of, uh, of mistletoe, certainly if you've ever used uh, sandalwood. Sandalwood is a parasitic plant. Um, but you have these spore-like structures. Sorry about that. She is chewing away at boxes back here and it's going to get loud. Um, so there, you can look at the, the directionality of this relationship between um, little small root-like structures, there's a signal from a neighboring plant, um, and then you get growth of that parasitic plant into a host plant. And there are all kinds of different signals. You can see different types. But what's really important when we talk about this medicinally is in something like dotter, which came out of uh, traditional Chinese medicine, and it's a very useful plant. Um, there's actually a molecular conversation that occurs between the plant parasite and different host plants. And so you end up having these mRNAs that we talked about earlier, moving back and forth. Um, and this basically is a way for the plant to recognize, um, this is a parasite that I don't mind having a relationship with. And so I'm gonna kind of damp down my defense response. In another plant, Particularis, which is also a wonderful um, plant for therapeutic reasons, It's called a green root parasite. <clears throat> and there are over 40 species in North America alone. And they have a big host range, 80 different species. And so the clinical efficacy has been fairly inconsistent in some respects. And that's because what we didn't understand was, depending on the host plant, right, the, the particularis is that first column, and those are different types of particularis. The second column are the different hosts and then the fourth column are the different types of compounds made in response to that relationship. And so now we've learned to recognize um, the appropriate relationship, oftentimes by the change of color in the host plant, that this, this particular color flower uh, represents or tends to speak of the fact that these are pyrazidine alkaloids being made or quin quinolosidine alkaloids. And so this makes for a fascinating um, use of a plant and requires a fairly unique skill set to recognize um, which particularis are being used for particular therapeutic endpoints. All right, so we came to this last part here, which is really the, the piece where humans and plants begin to interact and they begin to influence each other. Um, and we're gonna talk about some concepts and I'm gonna go over these briefly, adaptation really is sort of a, a fulcrum for evolutionary change. Um, the, the graph gives you a good idea. Um, we have uh, both Liverpool and Detroit, two cities that used a lot of coal. Back in 1959, uh, the dark colored moths uh, 
dominated. There were much more of those that gene pool was much richer. And you can see there was a lot of soot on buildings from Liverpool and Detroit being big um, industrial towns and coal being a big source of energy. Because that light colored moth was easy to spot by uh, the uh, predators. Now, once coal went out by 1995, you saw the light colored moth uh, grow in terms of numbers in the population and the dark colored moth go way down. And that's because they were easily spotted. So this is an adaption mechanism where the genes that coded for a light color um, survived and more of those made babies and showed up more in the environment. So the, the adaption uh, adaptation is a fulcrum to take underlying genetic change and, you, and as long as it's a benefit, um, have more of that in the population. And it's not a simple complex, right? This is a, a, a complex system. That image is murmuration, if you're familiar with it. It's, uh, it's the swallows flying in formation. In its simplest descriptor, um, seven swallows follow each other. There are sort of two rules of interaction. Seven swallows follow each other closely, and then they try to be close to the, the nearest group. And those two actions in a large population creates these wonderful patterns of movement of swallows in the air. Um, and so you've got to, in any kind of system, and we're talking about the system of plants and humans interacting, um, you've got a, a lot of interconnected components and there's something called emergent behavior, which is very difficult to predict. That's the pattern we see in murmuration. And so ecosystem diversity, we found tends to be proportional to the stability of that system. The more complex the system, um, the more stable it is. We see this actually in heart rate rhythm, that heart rate rhythms are actually the norm in healthy individuals. When, the, when there tends to be a simpler rhythm, that tends to be more disease oriented. So we tend to see a marked uh, by less complex dynamics. And the loss of that complexity is really a loss of information and a loss of adaptability. So in complex systems, you have tremendous amounts of adaptability built in. And we talk about, um, I wanted to find this just because you're going to see this in the literature. Mutations are, uh, genetic mutations are changes in base pairs, if you remember your basic biology. Um, epigenetics is heritable change in gene activity. That's not caused by change in the actual sequence. So the genes remain the same, but what we'll do is we'll see something called methylation, where a methyl group is added to a gene, and that actually reduces the activity of that gene by blocking where proteins can go and bind at something called the promoter region. That's sort of a uh, imagine it as an individual with a flag waving over here, over here, over here. And that flag waver gets shut down. And also something called histone modification, where um, when genes are quiescent or not being expressed, they're wound very tightly around a spool. Um, that's the histone. And so by modifying that, it sort of limits how quickly it'll un un unreal and uh, for the regions of the DNA that are specific genes, they'll stay, stay wound up and they won't get expressed. And these are things that occur in response to environmental stimuli. And we can actually pass on that uh, genetic response to the environment through our genes, but not as, a, as a, a genetic mutation, but as an epigenetic change. So we're gonna talk about coevolution. These are two structurally coupled systems, plants, humans, and they act as selective agents for each other. And because of that dual action, you tend to get what are called novel trajectories or emergent phenomena. And this is what it'll look like. We can, we can talk about wild and tame food, if you will. Um, early humans, they were exposed to a lot of phytochemicals, right? 80 to 220,000 phytochemicals is, a, is a, a more recent estimate. And now we're exposed to around um, 10,000 phytochemicals, uh, probably even less than that in some regions of the world. And a lot of this has to do with agriculture about six, 8,000 years ago. And we have a record of 
2,500 domesticated plants where we've reduced the secondary metabolites because we were trying to reduce flavor components or the pigmentation or potentially even the toxicity. The example of this on the upper right is the brassica family or the mustard family. So wild mustard, if you've ever eaten wild mustard, it is um, pretty hot, right? Um, you've got things like kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower. Uh, these are all um, part of the same family and they, they don't have that bite of raw mustard. Um, not, not the spread, but the, the plant itself. Have you ever recent eaten mustard greens? Um, it traditionally in uh, the South where my family comes from, mustard greens are, are eaten on a pretty regular basis, but it tends to be cooked down. Again, we started using all kinds of tools to reduce the, the toxicity, the flavor, the, the numbers of phytochemicals. And so early humans are foraging and there was what we call constant low level plant mutagens in the diet, meaning these plants may have influenced mutation rates or what we call genetic drift. There could have been uh, dietary immune modulators that have influenced the immune system either adversely or advantageously. And so you would have seen um, tribes that were able to um, find plants that help protect them from infections and the, the aftermath of infections. Um, they will have uh, had more offspring, more of that same sort of uh, uh, gene and plant relationship grow over time as they continue to eat from a particular area and they passed on knowledge that, hey, this plant is good to fight battle wounds or uh, infections. We also had uh, psychoactive plants. Psychoactive plants were very much involved in language development. Um, psychoactive plants couldn't be caffeine, right, for endurance. Um, plants that involved uh, enhancing our cognitive function or visual acuity, being able to see at distance during a hunt. So um, examples of this, um, in, in primates, they can actually make their own vitamin C. But once humans had stopped foraging on vitamin C rich plants and relied on cultivated plants, the, the complex biochemical pathway to make vitamin C became dormant. And so that's where we have to seek vitamin C from external sources. Uh, another example would be estrogen rich plants um, that were chosen for domestication. This might've been red clover as an example um, because it may have influenced ovulation cycles. Uh, early humans may have been very aware that um, you know, birth at certain times of year was more advantageous than other times of year. Um, and and uh, I'm sure um, women from early on were also trying to figure out ways to have birth control uh, for their own purposes and for the purposes of the tribe or the child. Um, this other hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, we refer to these in many respects as adaptogens today. They go by a number of names, tonics, trophorestoratives, um, uh, in Ayurveda, the Rasayanas. But they tend to promote healthy regulation of hormones, uh, they tend to enhance neuroplasticity, the ability to learn, to remember material, uh, to innovate. And they tend to mitigate chronic diseases um, by actually uh, activating what we call adaptive stress response signaling. Uh, and in its simplest form, you know this as um, exercise um, is something that leads to muscles being inflamed and torn down and um, hurting. But in the long run, our adaptive response to that is to strengthen. And so the ancient peoples figured out something called hormesis, which is based on this uh, graph on the left, resveratrol concentrations. Very low concentrations maybe didn't have a particular uh, effect in the deficiency zone. In the hormetic zone, it had a positive impact. In the right-hand zone, um, there was reversible toxicity and then irreversible toxicity at even higher doses. So it goes from low dose on the left to high dose on the right. And we call this biphasic dose response curves. And we have a number of plants that we ingest 
uh, that uh, show this phenomena, resveratrol in red wine, sulforaphane in cruciferous uh, vegetables. These are your brassicas, your mustards, uh, curcumin, catechins in tea, allicins in garlic. Um, so this is something that was learned in uh, very early on, right? Uh, I call it the Mikey effect. Let Mikey eat it um, and uh, see what happens. Um, I can remember uh, as a little kid, in fact, in Germany, in Marburg, um, learning to go around the out backyard and I just ate different plants. And then later on, uh, when I got into high school, uh, or, or actually it was middle school, uh, smoking different plants just to see what would happen. And uh, you know, I figured out pretty quickly what made me really sick and what to stay away from. So this whole idea that we were early foragers it also is culture. Think about what you know about your own food from the culture that you originate from. Um, from my culture, uh, coming from Alexia, Mississippi, um, there were a lot of foods that came from the uh, Western African diaspora slave trade, um, watermelon, um, beans, rice, um, all kinds of things that are part of that culture um, had its origin somewhere else. Um, but there are foods that I love to eat that come from my cultural origins. Um, so the dietary preferences, in one sense, is sort of central to how our culture defines itself. Think about Anthony Bourdain traveling or all the different food shows. Um, the North American tribes, indigenous tribes, use plants as in a five to one ratio, medicine versus food. Now, we don't do that. Uh, think about that. I mean, there I... Um, I probably uh, use a pretty high ratio, but I've been trained and I and uh, um, I don't tend to use allopathic medicine. Maybe some of you too. Um, but we've got this biocultural evolution where human societies led to these complex civilization because they were able to transmit via oral and written language information. Right? We pass that on. And so literally this biocultural evolution overtook biology as the primary determinant of human progress and impact on the planet. Um, and so we've got some examples of human plant, what we call human plant dyads. Um, this is green tea and proline rich proteins. Um, if you've had green tea, you know that there's this uh, kind of tart, almost feels like your cheeks are getting squeezed in um, and that's really the binding of protein, proline-rich proteins with those catechins that I mentioned earlier. Um, and what it does is those catechins, we know they bind to the proteins of fungi, right, to prevent them from working. Well, they will bind to proteins in our gut that we've consumed. And if you eat enough of them, they can, they can have an anti-nutritive effect. Well, by binding to these proline-rich proteins, it prevents that from happening. Now, what we understand is in uh, cultures like Japan, the levels of proline-rich proteins excreted are much higher than, say, here in the U.S. And that's because their traditional use of green tea goes back a very long time. And speaking of the biocultural evolution, think about the green tea ceremony, how important that is within that culture and how to make it, how to prepare it, um, and all the elements that go into that preparation, presentation, and consumption. Now, um, this is uh, some research done in Western Africa um, uh, in the human plant parasite or triad that is absolutely fascinating. Um, sickle cell hemoglobin gene uh, is in high frequency in parts of Western Africa. And malaria uh, is hyperendemic, meaning it's just um, throughout the area, it happens a great deal. What's interesting is that that sickled hemoglobin cell actually prevents plasmodium from attaching to that red blood cell. So the presence of sickle cell anemia limits the, the parasite from causing malaria in people. Um, there's a third actor, and that's cassava, which is the main source of carbohydrates, and it contains a cyanogenic glycoside, um, which Remember, we talked in one case of glycoside becoming active after the sugar is cut off. Well, once that sugar is cut off, it becomes a thiocyanate. And that's a toxin. 
um, this chronic low level exposure to the cyanide, uh, you develop goiter, which has a swelling in the, uh, on the thymus and a bunch of glands in the throat, uh, tropical ataxic neuropathy, when you start to get nerve damage, uh, people are unsteady, uncoordinated, and then severe poisoning, especially during famines, um, uh, is sort of leads to outbreaks of debilitating irreversible paralytic disorder and sometimes death. So what's happening is that um, the, the impact is uh, on hemoglobin. In taking in that thiocyanate, it actually inhibits the sickling. So it increases the ability to carry oxygen and prolongs the um, life of that red blood cell. Um, it modifies the plasmodium proteins to inhibit the parasite. So the human and parasite exposure to these consistently high levels of cassava reduces the selective advantage of uh, the sickle cell. So remember, if we didn't have the cassava there, sickle cell anemia is a genetic mutation which can lead to early death and certainly is an unpleasant condition. You don't carry as much red blood, uh, oxygen in your red blood cells. Um, that, that is a selective agent against malaria. So if malaria is killing people at a faster rate than sickle cell anemia, you'll get more gene frequency for sickle cell anemia in the population because it helps people survive longer. Now the introduction of this toxic compound from cassava actually prevents the binding of the, of the plasmodium. So it prevents um, malaria. It also tends to inhibit some of the sickling in people that have sickle cell. So it enhances their ability to have functioning red blood cells. So the people consuming that, it takes longer for the effect of that toxin to impact the life of that individual. So you tend to get greater reproduction of people who are, are actually um, using cassava. Um, so it, that selective agent um, lowers sickle cell gene frequency over time. And this is a three agents acting together. And this is an ancient culture that's figured out there's some trade-offs to be made and, um, and how to go about doing that. So I'm gonna stop there with that example. Um, I hope I've been able to tie together the idea that you've got native compounds in organisms that begin to evolve over time. When they came into mammals and humans or plants, in this case, those plants had to interact with their environment, communicate, and that elicited a bunch of changes to make compounds that could signal hello or fight. And now humans began to interact with plants and figure out which ones were good for them, which ones weren't. And all through this, this coevolution meant those that adopted were able to survive longer, have more procreation, those genes got passed down. And in the case of humans, the knowledge, the biocultural element got passed down, not just the genetic information. So, um, I, you've been very patient. Any questions, I'd love to answer. Um, if you have any questions about this later on, you want to contact me, um, there's my email address. Um, if this uh, gets you interested in our programs, um, you can reach out to me, but certainly you can reach out to our admissions office. There's some contact information. Um, Michelle, thank you. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I love conversation with folks. I hope this has stimulated your thinking. Uh, I'd love to see some questions. Um, I know there's a lot to digest. Um, if you decide you've got a question later on, you've sort of been chewing on this uh, and you want to send it my way, let's start a conversation. Uh, in terms of which is healthier, um, that's, uh, I, I think that's a mixed bag. I think there are different things that they're good for uh, because some of the the polymer structures in the black tea um, have health effects on their own, particularly for cardiovascular disease. Um, the, the green tea is really better as an antibacterial. Uh, in some instances, I've seen where it, it actually may be uh, healthier for, in terms of cancer prevention. Um, so if you're drinking green tea, you know, 
Uh, I know it's probably it sounds weird, but swish it around um, in your mouth. Uh, it, it acts as a very good agent to kill off bacteria in the mouth. Um, interesting, Michelle. Thank you for that. Um, Um, Charles, your question about vegetarians and vegans, would their chemistry be different? Um, I think for that to be different, you'd want to look at societies where it's predominantly uh, vegan or vegetarian. You would probably see some differences. Um, you would certainly see differences in time in our microbiome, which is a whole other area of coevolution that I did not get into because there was so much to speak of. Um, but uh, you know, that's one way you would see some, uh, some epigenetic changes where uh, a diet over time influencing the makeup of your microbiome. Um, but in terms of uh, actual genetic mutations, you'd probably want to go into uh, looking at this on a social basis, what, what societies have been vegan or vegetarian for a long time versus uh, carnivores. And the other part coming into this is, is you'd want to look at where meat consumption has been um, based, on based on natural feeding of the animals uh, versus the, the kind of uh, industrial production of meat where you have a lot of additives that may have had an impact in terms of uh, gene mutations. So there, are, that's a good question. And what I would say is it actually needs to get broken down into a whole series of questions before you begin to be able to take off on a tangent and explore it. Uh, lab kits, uh, it depends on the course, but oftentimes our lab kits depends on uh, if you're in a material medical course, you're probably going to be exposed to a lot of different herbs that you're going to make teas or tinctures around. You're going to explore the organoleptic elements. Uh, maybe you'll, you'll try different concentrations at home to see an impact. In later courses where we're doing some extraction, there might even be some analytical techniques. There's one where you have to look at the yield of elderberry based on extraction with hot versus no heat, um, alcohol, no alcohol, acidic versus basic, um, and then uh, do some paper chromatography. So um, there are a bunch of different uh, elements to the kits depending on where you are in the program. Uh, when, when you say the benefits of ginseng, there are a number of benefits. Some of them are based on um, species uh, there are, are Nato ginseng, there's American ginseng, Chinese ginseng, there's an unrelated species, but we call Siberian ginseng. They all have very slightly different effects. And also, Masood, depending on where they're produced, uh, a, a wild-grown ginseng is going to have a very different profile of those ginsenicides, and therefore a different clinical endpoint. So sourcing your material, where they come from, uh, has a big impact on how you're going to end up using it. Can the online degree be completed over many years? Um, there are some options uh, to taking, instead of two courses a trimester, taking uh, one course a trimester. Um, that's something that you can work out once you get into the program with the um, student advisor. And we do have some options for doing that. Um, and uh, so that's, that's a conversation worth having. Um, people come in with very you know, complex home lives, work lives, and they need to adapt. And uh, we've tried to uh, create some options for that. Any other questions? Um, we do offer some financial aid. There's financial aid that is federal financial aid. And then there are uh, limited numbers of scholarships, Ryan. And that would be something to touch base with with the admissions office and they could get you that information. Um, my, it depends on the uh, program. So our post-baccalaureate certificates are usually a year or less. Those are anywhere from 12 to 15 credits. Our master's degree is 36 credits, which in a cohort fashion can be completed in two years. And then you can extend it uh, as circumstances require. Um, can uh, the postgraduate option move uh, to an MS? Um, yes, so the, uh, there is a post-baccalaureate certificate in herbal studies. Uh, it rep it's a 12-credit program. It represents the first 12 credits of our herbal, uh, of our, uh, herbal product design masters, as well as our 
clinical program. So um, it's a good way if you're not sure how committed you want to be. In general, those 12 credits allow you to use medicinal plants with family and friends more. Or if you're a clinician from a different discipline, it enhances your ability to use uh, herbs therapeutically. Um, but if you're just, you're not sure, hey, do I want to jump in and take 36 credits? This is a great way to get your feet wet. And if you're unsure, hey, I like both herbal product design and clinical herbalism, uh, which direction should I go in? This gives you exposure um, to the ideas, to faculty, and you get to get a sense of uh, where you're you know, most strongly pulled. So it's a great way to step into uh, the larger programs. I, I hope I get to see some of you um, in the program or just in conversation. Um, uh, thank you and um, good night.